All right, so let's start. It ta- let me start by saying that I understand that it takes balls is somewhat offensive to some people. And I'm not going to say that's just too bad, but I am going to say this. In sales, there is one thing, the number one rule in sales is get the customer's attention. If you don't get their attention, what are you going to sell them? Nothing, because they're not listening to you. So it takes balls as an attention getter. And yes. it, it, I'm sorry for some people that are going to be offended by it, but it's too bad. Your boss, he thought it was uh, politically incorrect. And I told him, yes, I know, but it's an attention getter. And that's what we need to do. It is. And my boss, just for anybody who doesn't know, and oh, by the way, my, my name is Travis Lindsay, entrepreneurship professor, blah, 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 co-founder of an of a investment fund here with Jose Calero, mentor in our program. Uh, has recently written a book called uh, uh, It Takes Balls to Start a Business. And uh, my boss is John Bradley Jackson. And uh, yeah, it's not politically correct, but it does grab people's attention. It's something that will break through and be the signal out of the noise. And that's what you're going for. That's exactly it. And I understood what what, uh, JJ said. I mean, he was right, of course. Listen, I know politically correct. I understand that. And I, my intention was not at all to offend anyone. But I'm out to sell books, and this is how I get attention. Yeah. I mean, you, you could have said chutzpah or, you know, it takes guts or anything like that. I could have but said donuts. Just... I could have said testicles. Yeah. Uh, I, I, intestinal fortitude. That's another yeah. one I've heard. It doesn't, open, it doesn't get your attention, but it takes balls, gets your attention. Let me, yeah. just, uh, let me make a quick comment on the book, though. Um, uh, I surveyed the landscape of available uh, uh, how to start a business books. There's a number of them on Amazon, and you can get them almost anywhere. Um, and, and they all talk about very detailed starting stuff. You know, you got to go out and you got to get a business license, and you got to talk to maybe an accountant, and you got to decide if you're going to lease or, or or buy, and are you going to open an office? I don't talk about any of that. That's all ground level stuff that I leave it up to those guys who do a very good job talking about them. My book is completely, it's exclusively treetop level. So my idea was this, let me show you what the landscape looks like, how business works, what it is, what its purpose is, what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to operate, why a profit is important, why customers are important and why employees are even more important. But it, it talks about the importance of different kinds of industries, or not the, but I described industries. I also give four uh, business examples, which by the way, three of the four were all customers of mine for at least 15 years. They're big cut companies, uh, uh, $500 million companies. So I use their examples of how they grew and, and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, the fourth one I just took out of the I know this company, but they're not a customer, but I know how they operate, who they are, and how they work. So what I've done was give a person an overview of business in America. And if you're going to do, if it's going to be a brick and mortar business or an online business, it's going to be a service business or a product business. Uh, If you're going to start something, you know, you're going to have to have some money to start with. You just can't start on a wish and a prayer. It's going to take some dough. And for those people, this is book is mostly for people who are maybe halfway into a career or ending a career and they want to, and they have some money and they want to start something that they can do from home because they just don't want to retire. This book will give them all the information they need. And uh, I've had uh, JJ read this book twice and he thought it was pretty good. Uh, as you can tell by the recommendation he gave me on the book. Yeah. So, and by the way, I didn't hold a gun to his head on this. He did it willingly. And in fact, he was anxious. So I was grateful to JJ. And by the way, I think part of that is the 11 years that I mentored at the school. It's, it's earned me some um, uh, cash revenue there. Yeah, well, he did tell me that you didn't hold a gun to his head, but you did tell him that it would be a shame if something were to happen to his Corvette. No, I, no, no, that's not what I said. I said, I know you parked your Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a little, little bit different, a little bit different. Yeah, it's, it's, it's subtle. Not quite subtle in your face, right? Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, like, like what, what you're talking about earlier about all the basic stuff, like forming your LLC, doing all that stuff. I mean, there, there's so much information that's freely available online. Hell, I just created an LLC uh, last week while I was in another meeting. I just, I went through the, the process there, set that up. But yeah, the, the important stuff, the thing that's going to differentiate your business are those higher level strategic concerns that you're talking about. Yes. And that, that, that's what an entrepreneur has to focus on. They don't need, they, they, they can't monopolize their time with the nitty gritty of, of the day to day. They have to focus on the bigger picture. And that's, that's something that I know, you know, from my, our interactions over the years that you have a very, very good handle on. Uh, so like, can you give like a little bit of a taste of uh, a little more of a taste of what's in the book? Like what's, what's one of the, the strategic things that most like first time entrepreneurs don't realize they need to focus on until maybe it might be a little too late or a little bit later on in their entrepreneurial career. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a number of things I can start at any levels, but primarily the, the point I tried to make was that before you do anything like this, you got to prepare yourself. You just can't throw caution to the wind and say, oh, well, it'll happen and this is the way it's going to work. One, some, some very valuable lessons I learned while mentoring at, at Cal State Fullerton was that um, if you're going to start a business and you're going to invest some of your money, you better make sure you know what you're talking about and that, is, that you're, you're aiming at a target that is real and uh, legitimate. So, for example, um, three of the, I think, the most important devices any business entrepreneur who wants to start a business but wants to do it right, the first thing you got to do is think about the business, learn about it, and then do a SWOT analysis. You know what a SWOT analysis is, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That thing is just a brain-dead solution to determine right away if your business idea is any good or not. Because you have those four columns, you have to be honest. Uh, entrepreneurs have trouble not being honest, but seeing realism. They think that if they got it in their head, a lot of entrepreneurs and inventors think, well, geez, I invented it, it must be good, and I'm the only one that can sell it. So that's a flaw that a lot of them have, but um, you have to prepare yourself because preparation is everything. The second thing besides the SWOT analysis is a business model canvas. It's very simple, but you're a little further into the preparation of your business. You're about to, to uh, uh, initiate the business plan um, with all the financial details that are in it. But that uh, uh, business model canvas is essential because it gives you, it allows you to wrap your head around your entire business and how it's going to operate. But unless you have a vision of what your business is going to look like, where are you going? What are you going for? You don't know. And the third thing, of course, is the business plan, which takes time, particularly, particularly the financials. Those are the eye openers because somebody's going to do some extensions and some projections and says, holy crap, it's going to cost this much. Yep. These things are important to understand and to act, initiate, activate, and secure in your mind before you do anything like that. <clears throat> now, so preparation is, is one of them. I also talk about getting your head right because as an entrepreneur, as a person maybe who's never run a business or owned a business, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you've, got to, you've got to understand what kind of an attitude you've got to maintain throughout in order to be successful. You know, there's a whole bunch of platitudes that I mentioned. My favorite of all is never give up. I mean, to me, that is just, that is the finite point to doing anything in life, in particular, a business. If you plan it right, if you do your work, if you uh, research it and you, and you, let's say you get uh, score people involved, Score guys are great people. You know a lot of score guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mentored with a number of score guys. They were just great people. I love them. I love working with them. I'm not a score guy. Uh, I couldn't work in that structure. They can. I'm not a corporate oriented person. I'm an entrepreneur, kind of like a free spirit. So, <clears throat> but I do follow certain norms. And one of them is if you're going to start a business, there's certain basics you need to uh, uh, and grasp, embrace. Uh, and one of them, of course, not only is uh, pre preparation, but understanding your what your position is and what your attitude has to be in order to succeed. Because you can't have one of these, well, maybe I'll try it, maybe I won't. That just, 
I won't use uh, profanity here, but I'll use clothes. That's BS. That's stupid. That's, yeah. that's sophomoric thinking. To me, there's nothing more important than that. And then I also mentioned uh, one of the tricks that I, that I recommend to everybody is a PCM, a personal commitment, a PCS, a personal commitment statement. And here's what a PCS is. When you start your motivation and your, and your goal start to seem further away, you start losing interest, what about that PCM? And what is a PCS? I mean, a personal commitment statement. You read it, and what it does is it kicks you in the butt. It is you talking to you, yourself, saying, this is the reason I started this, and this is the purpose I'm doing, and this is what it's going to look like when I get there. And if I keep going and keep pushing, I will get there. And I also tell them, this is a personal commitment statement just for you. Use whatever language you need to use to keep yourself motivated, expletives included. But yeah. use whatever language is needed. You know, kick yourself in the butt and have it handy. So whenever you start to weigh and you whip it out, you read it, then you go back to work. It's, listen, starting a business is not easy. It's not for the faint of heart, as is old age. But it is what it is. And you know what? I'm 74 years old. I'm still going. I'm on my second book that I'm writing for Baby Boomers. I think I mentioned it. Did I mention it to you? I won't go uh, Yeah, I think so, yeah. But let's talk about the book. Um, Hold on. Hold on. I have a copy. Now let me get a, the uh, table of contents. If there's a number of, of uh, what's a business for? You know, it's kind of basic. Chapter two is what's a business for? Mm -hmm. Most people don't understand what a business is for. They think it's just to make money for them, but it's not. There's a lot more to it because in a big way, a business owner is like daddy at a family. And if he does well, he brings food home to the table, which is his employees. If he doesn't do well, then he starts letting them go. And pretty soon he has no employees and no business. So there's a responsibility, there's a burden, a huge burden of ownership that if you're not, if you're not, if you don't understand it, you're not going to benefit from it. And you're going to do a lot of stupid stuff. Uh, my third paragraph, the third chapter is, um, Preparation is everything. What it takes to start a business, product a business versus service business. Uh, let me hit one that I want to talk about. Four business models. <clears throat> Launching a business. I talk about build, building a business and the importance of when building a business, the importance of innovating or dying. Because if you're not innovating or bringing in new products, you're dying. We, we uh, typically try to bring in three to four new products every year. Uh, these are things that we, some of them we made, some of them we bought, uh, they were for sale off the shelf, and we would modify it somehow to make it unique. So when we had other competitors buying the same product and listing it under us at a cheaper price, uh, they would tell Amazon it was the same item. We would uh, say, no, it's not. We get a picture of it, a sample of it, sample of ours. We take pictures, send it to Amazon, prove to them that it wasn't the same product, and they bounce the other people. Uh, so they wouldn't steal our orders. Right. Um, when, you're, when you're competing in business, there has to be a level of understanding in your mind that you could lose it at any time if you have some serious competitors come after you with a lot of cash or a lot of good product offerings that you're not offering. That's how we started making our own uh, cases, tablet cases, and notebook computer stands ourselves so we wouldn't have any competition. Yes, there was tooling charges involved, usually between five and $10,000, but we knew that the product was hot enough that we would make our money back in you know, four to six months on a tool, and we usually did. And then we had another four to six months of good sales, and then the new product would come in. I'm talking about iPads. The new iPad would come in, they'd change the style somehow, move the camera, move this, we'd have to do a whole new tool, but it was worth it because we were generally one of the first people out with a new iPad case for the new iPads. We could get them produced very quickly in China. Uh, we would basically have our partner buy the new iPad in China, reverse engineer it, uh, produce a prototype for us in about 10 days, send it to us. We test it on our iPads if we liked it, or we'd make a change if there was an iteration change, but we, um, once we got to the final, we go ahead and produce, get the tooling made, took three, 30 days, and then we 
excuse me, we'd produce an order of say 2,500 units. We'd have 500 of them air freighted in. The other 2,000 would come in on a slow boat from China. So the idea was, you know, what's that expression? First mover advantage, first mover opportunity. The problem with being the first mover, however, is as soon as you introduce the thing and you're the first mover, your competitor comes in, refines it, comes in with a better product at a slightly better price. So that's, you know, you have to innovate. If you're not innovating, somebody's gonna eat your lunch and then you don't have anything. You have to, con after you launch a business, you've got to find ways to innovate your business, to continue grow it and maintain your market position. Otherwise, your competitors are gonna roll right over you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like what you were just talking about right there about uh, providing like uh, uh, iPad covers. I mean, the, the, the life cycle of that product is probably about a year. That's it. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a year. The new model comes in and guess what? That, that old thing that you spent tens of thousands of dollars on uh, investing in, maybe more, uh, that's, that's gone now. So either you keep on building new products or you're done. And that, that's, the, that's the case for just about every business. Yes. The, only ones, the only ones I could think of that you know, maybe could get a little bit away with not innovating as much would be like a Coca-Cola. But they're innovating all the time too. Yeah, and not only different ways. They're, well, they're obviously uh, broadening their category by buying all these companies. They're making seltzers and different mm -hmm. kind of flavor. So it's not the Coca-Cola, but it's the brand that is expanding. And that's what's important. Yeah. One of the other chapters I have here is why customer service is important mm -hmm. to me. Oh, it's huge. The, I, it is huge. The companies that have the greatest degree of success are the ones that provide the most service to their customers and make them feel loved. Yeah. That's what customers want. Love me. Show me you love me. So to me, um, I've always, prior to this business that we've had for 20 years, I was a packaging salesman in Los Angeles for 20 years. And I love my customers to death. I never, ever lost a customer except to death or if he was promoted and moved up. But I never lost a customer in, in all those 20 years. And I had this this simple thing saying that I think a lot of people misunderstand. You know the old saying, customer's always right. No, they're not. Customer's not always right, but they are always the customer, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to remember. They may not always be right, and sometimes they're wrong, most often they're wrong, but they're the customer, and you gotta mm -hmm. treat them in the same way. I have this thing about uh, the word service, as in customer service, and each letter stands for a different word. Sincerity, enthusiasm, respect, vitality, initiative, concern, and excellence. If you learn the true meaning of each one of those words, you will understand what it takes to become a professional, fully uh, invested customer service representative. But, and it's explained here, not only customer service, but I explained it from the very beginning, customer needs that's what we want to focus on not the service so there's um, there's another um well and, and then just speaking about customer service i mean it, it starts well before you even build a product right i mean it, it, it's something that you have to go out you have to talk with people you have to find out what their actual problem is you're, you're, you're providing a solution for them they may not know exactly what that solution would be i mean for example with the laptop desk of which you donated uh thousands to us thank you by the way thank you you're uh, welcome yeah, uh, I mean, uh, talk about that a little bit. I mean, you had to go, you, you, ha you saw the problem yourself and I'm sure you talked with other people or you saw other people have the same problem about having a laptop just sitting on their legs, uh, burning their, well, you know, uh, since you said it earlier, burning their balls off. And uh, uh, you decided that you needed to create a solution for that, right? Well, that actually, yes, that's exactly correct. But I came to it in a roundabout sort of way. Uh, I was a packaging salesman driving around, seeing my customers all over, you know, Los Angeles, uh, into uh, some in the San Bernardino County, but mostly in Los Angeles. And um, I would <clears throat> drive around visiting my, visit my customers, but when they call, I, I would have a piece of cardboard sitting on the armrest and the gear shift knob. And when the customers called <clears throat> with an order, I would have a notepad here on this thing on my right hand, and I would be holding my, the phone with my left hand. There was no speakerphone yet. And I would be driving with my left knee. So here I'm driving 
taking orders, driving. <laughs> and I did this for, I don't know, 20 years. And I wouldn't recommend it to anybody because it's dangerous. And I never got in an accident and I never came close, but still it was stupid. But I was a salesman then. I was, I've never been paid a salary. I've always been commissioned all my life. So I'm a commissioned salesman. I'm not going to stop to make a phone call. I'm like a shark. I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to rest. So anyway, I took this and formalized this auto desk and eventually really had a number I made, had components made for it, had a vinyl, a, a, a vinyl cover made for it that matched the interior of my infinity Q45 automobile. And it had this cone thing with a hole that went over the gear shift knob and two grips that gripped the armrest. I mean, it was a nice looking piece of automobile upscale automobile interior. Yeah. So I, I retired from that 20 year job sales career making six figures, very comfy job, easy job. And I left to, to, to launch this, this uh, auto desk as I called it. Well, typical to my style in those days, prior to getting educated, I put the cart before the horse. I should have had a feasibility study done on that thing before I left my cushy job. But no, I didn't. I left with all this enthusiasm. And so what happens? I did have a feasibility study done by Cal State San Bernardino, by the marketing department there. And they said, oh, too bad. It's small market. You can sell it to, I don't know, uh, Pep Boys and Rock Auto and those kinds of things after market but you, you're not gonna be able to sell it to dealers and every car interior is different. They said, you're gonna to have to make it out of plastic so it's adjustable. And then after the, hearing that news and seeing it was in a small market, you know, it was, it was a shock. But during the time before I got, yeah, during the time I was waiting this, the month for the marketing study to come out of the school, the feasibility study, I did a lot of research online for customers and I found a group called Mobile Professionals. These are business people who are traveling with their notebook computers. And they were complaining, geez, my notebook gets so hot on my lap, I can't. And back in those days, MacBooks, you could turn them upside down and fry an egg on it because they'd get that oh, yeah. hot. So I found this group. And then one night after I received the, the response from the uh, uh, Cal State students, and I was really disappointed, actually deflated. I took my auto desk and just took it and put it on my lap one day and suddenly realized, whoa, I could make a desk out of this. So, and then I said, wait a minute. I learned all this stuff about mobile professionals. They want it lightweight. I can make it out of plastic. They want it to fit in their, in their computer bag. I can make it so it folds in half. They want it so it deflects the heat. I can put heating channels in it. They want it so it grips their clothes. I can put rubber on, so I did all that. I found a really good industrial designer who helped, and then a, uh, a mechanical engineer who helped apply the math to the design, and then we did some prototypes. It took us two and a half years, but in that time of spending a lot of money trying to get attention on the laptop desk, which is the new product that I launched, <clears throat> we, with all our advertising, we drew the attention of Targus, the computer bank people, and within Three months of taking it on in March of 2003, they started selling 22,000 units a month. Wow. In retail at Best Buy and all those computer stores at the time. And for six years, we were doing $2 million a year with them on one product. Wow. So it's, it's one of those uh, uh, overnight successes that took years to... to yeah, exactly. But here's the other thing. <laughs> you know, when, you, when after, after you, every time you learn something new, it causes you to go back on decisions you made or courses you've taken and cause you to realize the error of your ways. For example, the six years I was working with Targus, I never, I, every two years I made a new iteration of my laptop desk. It changed the, the style and the design because those things just are only good for about two years on the shelf. So every two years I gave them a new one. And what I should have been doing was taking creating another new one and taking it to their competitors and continuing to take new ones to their competitors. I was so afraid that they were going to bounce me if I took it to one of their competitors. And at the end, I learned what a stupid thinking that was. I could have taken it and I would have, could have made a lot more money 
But those are the mistakes you make when you, that, you, that you see in hindsight that you shouldn't have made. But you did, and the best thing to do is realize it, learn it, and put it in a book so other people don't make the same dumbass mistake. Absolutely. All right. I mean, I think that we are over time now. Uh, if, is there anything else that you would like to, to talk about? Any other like final sales pitch? I do notice that you have a, 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 a license plate in, in the background that says customer service. Oh, you can see that? Yeah. For, for that was a license plate on my car for <laughs> 20 years. I had that on my car. I just changed it to every new car I bought. And in 1997, yeah, in 1997, the company was opening, moving into Mexico to sell. So they opened up an office in, uh, in Tijuana. The president of the company, knowing that I spoke Spanish and we were friends and we played racquetball regularly, he said, Jose, we're going to open an office. You want to be the division manager? I said, no, I don't want to report directly to you. Why not? Because I don't like the way you treat your people, but I will be sales manager for a year. And he said, okay, I'll find somebody else. Indeed. So I went down every Tuesday and Wednesday. I drive down Tuesday morning to Tijuana, spend the night, and Wednesday evening I drive home. And I earned, in that time, that year I was there, I not only maintained my sales in Los Angeles, but I earned an extra $50,000 in sales that year in Tijuana. So but the point I was making about that is, I forgot. I, I, I've been there so many times, don't worry about it. No, no, it, no, <laughs> this problem, this is, this, I'm 74 years old. This happens to people my age. It happens it to people my smart. age, man. There was a word in your head, but it's gone. It's yeah, all right. I mean, I, I, I just get into it, start telling the story, and then I start telling a different story, and then exactly. by the time it's over, I have, I have no well, clue where, where I am. This happens to me because I'm attention deficit disorder. That's why I'm having this issue. Yeah. Okay, no, do it. we were talking about something on sales. What, yeah, uh, listen, I've been a salesman all my life. To me, there is nothing more valuable than learning how to sell. And why is that important? Because you learn how to treat people with, with genuine respect. You're not right. feigning it, you're not putting it on. And, and people who see salespeople all the time, they can see the ones who are just full of BS. They're just trying to gain a foothold. Um, to me, the most important thing was honesty. If there was ever a problem with an order for a customer, they were the first call I made. I didn't want them to find out afterwards. The sooner they know it, the sooner you can start making arrangements to uh, options, alternatives. But if you keep it to yourself, it's a mistake. And, customer, and, that, and that shows a level of distrust. You yeah. cannot treat people that way. You got to treat them with the same degree of trust. When my three sons, I have three sons, they're all in their forties. Makes me feel really old. But I have three sons. They're all in their forties. Uh, one's a teacher with his master's degree. The other one's is an attorney in San Diego. And son number three is chief of staff for our state senator. They're all accomplished guys, and they all are very capable of speaking extemporaneously on their feet. And they got that because of the conversations we would have at the dinner table when they were young. And I'd tell them, I don't care how many, how good your ideas are when you grow up and how brilliant they are. If you don't have the language to communicate and express them, then I want you to close your eyes and tell me what you see, nothing. And that's what you're gonna have if you can't communicate well. So communication is everything. I'm a bit of a communicator, as you can tell. My children are equally skilled and it's a it's it's the best gift i could have given them the the ability and the and the understanding the importance of communication yeah no it, it, it's it's a it's an it's essential a, human ability to be able to communicate in a way that expresses what you're thinking and shares your thoughts without making the other people person feel less than Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's an essential part of being a, a leader, whether you're an entrepreneur, a politician, a teacher in the classroom, you've got to be able to explain what it is you're talking about and not in a way where you belittle the other person in a way where you build them up and make them more than they. Yeah, exactly. That, that's be. essential. And I did that with my kids, by the way, it came to me, the customer service. When I was going down to Tijuana for the whole year, I had no idea that all the Mexicans that were there were seeing, not my licensed customer service, they were seeing custom service. 
Oh. So that's why I had lots of cars make room for me. As I was driving <laughs> through the streets of Tijuana, they would all move. Couldn't understand it. It was after, afterwards that I realized they were me taking his customer service. How about that? Anyway, um, no, I think the best, I think, I think what, the, what I want to leave, I want to impart here is that this is a serious undertaking, starting a business. And it depends on what you're going to invest. When we started, we launched our business. I took all of my retirement that I built over 20 years working as a salesman, $720,000. And I invested it all in the business. It was a bit of a mistake because I thought that's what I needed to do, but I really didn't. But in two and a half years or almost three years, I spent it all <clears throat> on advertising, full page ads, drawing attention to the product. And here's another mistake I made. I had one product and I was trying to bring the world to my, to my website to see my one product. That was just stupid. So what I learned was basically is that you have to approach your business based on how it's starting and what it is you want from it and what you're trying to do. And if you only have one product, it's gonna to be tough to make it. You have to bring in more stuff. Absolutely. Well, we will leave it there. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will add one more thing. So custom service, it, it got all the people in Tijuana to steer clear of you. Probably a very good thing hearing how you would uh, make sales earlier on. That's I guess so. That's probably why you didn't have too many accidents. Not many, uh, hopefully.